Okay, so uh, what, if you could go back, what was the initial inspiration to set up vineyards both in Lebanon and Syria? So essentially, uh, my father has always been passionate about wine. And in 1997, he decided to produce wine. And we, we, we went to Bordeaux, he took us, the whole family, to, to actually go and buy a small property in, 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 uh, in Bordeaux. And he quickly realized, realized that uh, 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 it was difficult to manage a vineyard while living in Lebanon. So he took the decision very quickly to come back to Lebanon and establish a vineyard here in the Beka and as well in Syria because our family is from Syria, uh, originating from the city of Latakia. And we've always been uh, living between those two cities, Latakia and Beirut. So we thought that doing, um, establishing a vineyard in Syria, being the first vineyard, was a very challenging adventure and we just went for it. What, well, at the time, this must have been 2005, I think, what, was, what at the time did you think would be the biggest challenge of establishing a winery in Syria? Well, it, it started a bit earlier, actually. 97 was the trigger. 99, 2000, we found the, uh, uh, the locations. 2003, we planted the vineyard in Syria, and 2005 in Lebanon. So at that time, I think that um, we we're extremely uh, excited about the fact that in Syria, uh, that was not known for produ producing a high quality wine, how can we put back Syria on the map of, pro of producing high quality wines according to international standards, bringing international varieties, cepage, uh, bringing all the equipment that was necessary to produce high quality wines and obviously bringing the know-how. This is why we brought also Stéphane de Renoncourt. And so the whole idea was very exciting. In the BK, we knew we were doing a, a, a project in an area that was already well established and famous worldwide for doing wine. And while it was a different challenge than Syria, it also presented its own challenges. How to produce a high quality wine and compete in a market where there were already big names. So each project actually presented its own challenges and, 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 and its side of the adventure. But at the time, when you were <coughs> looking to Syria, it was the biggest challenge was to try and convince the international market that Syria could produce uh, world-class wine that was world-class. Exactly. Uh, but uh, this only came when we had the first bottle, where we could present the wines and prove that we did a good job. R obviously, everyone has an opinion on it, but we consider that we, we've, we've been able to get out a good product and, uh, and that we have Bargelus now on the world map. Um, uh, but I remember in 2005, 6, 7, before the wines actually was released, when we were saying that we were doing a project in Syria, we had people that were looking at us ah, in a way that they, would, they were asking themselves the question, will they be able to do a quality product or they're going to do a mass, big volume, low quality wine. And everybody was actually thinking that in Syria we're going to do three, four, five million bottles because the land was cheap. But this is exactly the opposite that we did. We actually have a very small vineyard, 12 hectares, and we're producing a high quality wine. So obviously the image of Syria at that time of producing a wine was not the best and uh, people were also very curious to know what we were going to get out. And yet you were still able to convince one of the most respected wine consultants in the world to lend his name to a project. That must have been quite exciting. That must have validated your, your initial assumption. Obviously, yes. Uh, when, when we... Um, contacting Stéphane de Renoncourt was something that happened through channels and friends that lived in Bordeaux. And um, um, I obviously finally called Stéphane de Renoncourt and 
agreed with him that he would come to see the vineyards because Stefan would not say yes or no before he sees the vineyards. And I uh, was myself and my brother were going also to meet Stefan before we're going to work with him. And so we, 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 uh, we agreed to meet in Bargelus. And this is the first time, it was the first time in Bargelus that we met Karim and myself, Stéphane de Renoncourt. So he, he got one morning to, uh, to Bargelus after uh, spending uh, four hours and a half in a taxi car from Beirut airport and obviously taking the four or five hours before uh, 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 to come from, from Paris uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to Bargelus. So he actually spent about eight to ten hours traveling to get there. And the first thing he saw was the terroir of Bargelus and he immediately fell in love with it. Um, so, and this is something he says. So if you, if, if you see sometimes when he talks about Bargelus, he always talks about the terroir of Bargelus. And this is what really got him to be convinced about the project, plus the determination we had as a family. Because we, he wanted to know as well, are we committed to do quality? He wasn't going to be involved for a project that was going to do a low quality wine. And I think he found that the terroir in both Marcias and Bargelius were high quality. And he found and realized that the family was determined to do quality wines. And that's how we actually finally uh, agreed to work together. And tell me, the first vintages that came out of both Marcias and Bargelius, how, what was the anticipation? What did you feel when you first tasted them? Was was, I mean, just how did you feel? I mean, it must have been a very exciting, exciting moment for you, not, not only in the Bekaa, but also in, in Syria, given the investment, it was. The, the aspirations that you had. It was. Uh, um, this is also something that we say, that I happen to repeat to people that tell me, how is the adventure of producing wine? And I, and I almost every time, um, encourage people, obviously it depends on the character of each person, but uh, each person that would like to do a wine and, spend and, do and, and go into an adventure would rather create a new vineyard from scratch than go and buy an existing vineyard because there's this adventure component uh, that does not exist when you buy a vineyard. The risk, you're actually taking a risk and you don't know what's going to get out. You obviously know that the terroir is good, you're doing everything right, but ultimately, until you have the first drop, you don't know what's going to give to be, to, to, to your vineyard, you don't know what's going to be, to, to, to give. So I remember that the, uh, the first vintage we had as uh, Bargelus was the 2006 red, and the family was there in Bargelus and waiting for the first glass of wine from the vats after the fermentations were, were over. And that was an extremely emotional moment because we were here tasting the wine and um, finally uh, 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 tasting the product of seven to eight years of work. That was a very exciting moment, and something memorable. And, and not only exciting, I imagine, but given, <coughs> given the distinct character of the wine, from the distinct terroir in Syria, that must have been even more exciting. Not only was the wine good, it must have been, diff the fact that it was different must have added to the, to the exactly. sense of satisfaction. The fact was different, and be without getting into, it was good, it was different, it was also very emotional because it was the, 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 the result of so much work. It was like a baby uh, 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 actually being born. So. It was a very exciting and emotional moment. Uh, and when you took it, I remember we went to Paris in 2008, when you took exactly. your wine abroad, mm. how was the reaction? How was, because all this must be a kind of gradual kind of momentum building up. You, you invest, you plant, you wait, you harvest, you make, you taste, and then you want to show it off to the world. Exactly. I don't know if, if Paris 2008 was one of the first times that you took it out there the world but I mean how did that feel as well I mean what was that moment of, of, of how did that feel on your journey it was the first time 
it's uh, very precise. It's, it was in 2008, first event, first time that we actually uh, launch the wines and, and talk about it internationally. And it was in the Georges V in Paris uh, in 2008. If I'm not mistaken, it was November 2008. And uh, obviously there is this mixed feeling. You are confident about your product, but you're also making everyone taste it for the first time. So you want to see what will be the reactions. And, uh, and uh, there's always this little fear inside of you uh, whether people will say excellent, will say too young, or will say promising, etc., etc. So obviously there's this little fear. Everybody should admit this. But uh, I think we, we, we had a good, a good recognition. Um, many people heard about this event. Uh, because it was the first time that uh, a wine from Lebanon and from Syria at the same time were launched by one family. Chateau Marcias and Domaine de Bargelus were launched at the same time. And, and, uh, and I think, uh, I, still, I still meet sommeliers in Paris that tell me um, we remember that event. It was the first time we tasted two wines from the region at the same time. Um, I think it was a trigger. It was a positive trigger. And then I suppose the supreme irony, if you want, is that given the fact that Lebanon is the country that's known where things can go wrong suddenly overnight, Lebanon is the country of conflict. The supreme irony must be that in 2011, it was Syria that began to fall apart. What was your initial feeling when you began to see the first signs of internal conflict or instability? Did you think that, it's, don't worry, it'll pass, or did you think this could be quite serious, we might have to implement plan B or change our strategy? How did you feel? Tell you the truth, when um, the, 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 the first few months of the conflict, everybody always thinks that it's going to be over soon. So nobody actually does any plan. But after this first six months, um, we decided to start planning for logistics. And at that time, we thought that the basic, basic things we should do is order, for example, more glass bottles uh, uh, as a stock for two vintages plus cork, uh, these two things being the most important. Why? Because at least we can bottle the wines and keep them. It's another side of the story to ship the wines out, but at least we can continue to harvest if we were not able to bring bottles in. So this, is, this was the first step. Obviously, after that period and since the conflict started, we, we, we've had many problems. Uh, on the logistics level. Shipping the wines out, the time it took, the, the, the formalities uh, uh, it took, not necessarily in Syria, but everywhere outside Syria as well. So this is, let, if, if you will, this is the, the main problem we're facing today, logistics. Um, uh, uh, in August, on the other side, in last August, before the harvest, we had some uh, 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 combats happening about 500 meters away from the vineyard. That uh, lasted for a week and ultimately got resolved. So uh, 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 thanks God we could uh, harvest on time. But obviously it was a problem. It might have been a problem. What happened in that week specifically? Well, one morning the we, we get a call from uh, one uh, of our managers over there managing the vineyard and uh, he specifically tells us he is not able to get to the vineyard uh, uh, nor uh, uh, could the workers get to the property. And so the vineyard was left alone. Uh, uh, no control, nobody there, uh, open doors and uh, combats happening 500 meters away. So we were very concerned 
very, very uh, 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 worried about what was happening because it was not a question of only having, uh, I don't know, bombs, bullets, whatever. It was also about uh, merchandise being stolen, vineyard being completely destroyed, the work of 10 years being completely destroyed so you, we've had to, we could have had to plant again. So obviously it was extremely uh, 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 problematic times. Uh, happily, it ended after a week, and uh, and uh, we continued work. And you were able to convince the vineyard workers to come back. Everybody got back the second day. Um, after a week, combats ended. People, after a week after that time, uh, went to the vineyard. It was safe again and we harvested in good conditions. Today in Bargerius, uh, we have a team that has been loyal. Uh, we have the same team. Uh, Everybody is happy to work at Bargerius because I think we are also creating a family spirit. And they're seeing that we're working uh, in a positive way, a uh, professional way. We're producing a high quality product. And uh, I think they are also uh, 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 concerned about the fact that uh, there is a company behind them, uh, not letting them do go, and, 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 and covering also all whatever, whatever they need. And, and today, I, I know that your main warehouse is in Belgium, I think. Exactly. Where does the wine, how does the wine have to travel? Where does it have to go to get to Belgium? So last time, last time we had to ship wines from Syria, we had to ship them through the port of Latakia. And it actually went to uh, Port Said in Egypt, came back to Beirut before it was shipped again to Belgium. Uh, that was about a 30-day voyage, so it took a lot of time. And, and, you know, when one looks at all this determination and resilience and a refusal to, <coughs> a refusal to, to throw in the towel, as it were, do you think that... How do you think this, this represents the spirit of the Levant? You see, I was talking to someone earlier today, and I said that we, in this part of the world, we're born into turbulence. We're born into a country or, or a region that is constantly being affected by turbulence. And this, this defines how we look at situations and how we solve problems. Do you think that... I mean, would you agree with this? And would you say that this is, this is part of the way the Lebanese do business and have done business for the last 2,000 years, two, 3,000 years? How, how do you feel about this? Do you feel you're part of it, this, this culture? I think we're, we have a, definitely we have a, a higher tolerance for risk and for, uh, for security issues, definitely. Uh, I think sometimes we, we stay, we, we, we do things, without realizing that we are taking a high level of risk. Uh, this being said, um, we're also here committed to stay in the land that is our own. So I think we, this, has to, this has to be taken into account. At the same time, a high tolerance for risk because we're born in that region. And I think we are used a little bit to instability. This is maybe insane to say, but this is the truth. At the same time, the fact of specifically for people who own vineyards, I think these people think for very, very long term. You don't plant a vineyard if your, your long term means 10 years. In our case, long term means generations. And I think the fact of planting vineyards in Syria and Lebanon is like a determination statement saying we're here to stay. If it's not us, it will be our children, we're staying. And I think also the, the decision of my father to say I'm doing a vineyard in Syria, I'm doing a vineyard in Lebanon, is a little bit, is, is saying in other words, like many families in Lebanon and Syria that are cross living in these countries, that we're staying in these two countries uh, we have ties in these two countries, and, and, uh, and we're, we're, we're going to stay there. Do you lie awake at night sometimes wondering about what's going to happen, both in Lebanon and Syria? I don't wake up at night 
thinking of this, but uh, it happens that I think about this subject uh, uh, often because we, we are living tough times these days, obviously. We are not living normal, normal times. Um, and we have to think every day of, um, of, of plan B. Uh, we have to uh, think of what would happen if this uh, situation evolves in that direction or another. So whether it's logistics, whether it's production, whether it's security, I think every, every person in Lebanon or specifically uh, every, any, any wine producer has a plan B. Uh, uh, but at the end of the day, the plan B cannot go to more than to a certain extent. Our, our vineyards are in a certain area. We cannot just take the vineyard and, and run away. We have to stay in that region. So plan B is always about uh, how to make work continue, not more. And tell me, how is Stefan's job, how Stefan had to uh, reconfigure his work um, regarding Bajalus, considering he can't go there anymore. How, how, has he, how has he been able to collaborate or to do his job? He's had to be quite creative, I understand. Well, Stefan is very amazing because uh, for a foreigner, um, he hasn't stopped coming to Beirut and I think he's experienced many, many, many events on the security level whether the airport was closed or a bomb there exploding, etc., he's, he's been committed to coming again and again. And very often I, I, I used to call him and tell him, Stefan, you're planning to come next week. Do you want to delay your trip? And his answer was always, no, I'm coming. So I'm, I'm very amazed of the commitment Stefan has for the two projects. Stefan has about 100 clients worldwide. Vajris and Marcias are some of the few that he visits himself personally. Uh, I think because his, he appreciates uh, 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 the wines we're making, he likes the history of the region, he likes the story that we're living with him behind these vineyards. Uh, so he's very committed um, uh, to, to, to Marcias and, and to Bargilius. Um, But when you smell the bottle, the glass of Bajalus 09 in your hand now, what, what's it mean to you? Well, 2009, um, <coughs> I'm not going to talk about the, 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 the vintage. What is the city and terroir, the produce of this, this, this ancient soil? Well, what does it mean to you? But when you here you're talking to the producer, so okay. on an emotional level, I'm very proud of what we have here. Uh, but again, there's this emotional component that is also talking or, or, or being added to the, to the, to the speech. Um, but um, we have a very nice terroir, um, very balanced. I think we have the right climate, the right soil, uh, the right difference in temperatures between night and day. Um, personally, I'm extremely proud of, of this product. This doesn't mean, though, that every winemaker has always to have a very humble attitude towards wine and always think that he can improve it. Uh, and this is something extremely important, in my opinion, to the wine industry in the region. Um, humility. Sometimes we lack humility in this region, and we believe we're doing the best wines. When you do wine, when you produce wine, you can never s believe that you're doing the best wine. You should always improve. And there's always room for improvement, adjustments, fine-tuning, learning. We all learn every day. Can you repeat the question I'm going to ask you just now? Okay. Jancis Robinson, in her latest World Atlas of Wine, did suggest that you were the arguably the best wine in the Near East. That must validate what, what you've done. And how does, that, how does that make you feel about the future for wines from Syria and the, and the region? Well, obviously, it's an enormous recognition coming from Jancis Robinson, 
as a, as, as a word recognized wine critic. So obviously it's an enormous encouragement to go forward and to say, okay, we've done a good job. But this doesn't mean that we should be happy about what we did and stop. We should take this as a base and say, okay, what we've done so far has given a certain result, has been recognized, means that if we work even harder, we might achieve even better results. So this is the attitude we should have. And I hope that, um, I hope that the future vintages that we produce will, uh, will always remain on that course of, uh, of, of quality and consistency. Can you just remind me what Janice has said about you? Well, Janice Robinson mentioned in her um, World Atlas of Wine, I think seventh edition, the latest edition, that Bargelus was uh, arguably the finest wine in the, in the East Mediterranean. And uh, that was, as I said, uh, uh, an enormous recognition and, 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 uh, and uh, encouragement for all the team in Bargelus. Something important to mention maybe that uh, you asked me earlier about uh, Stéphane de Renoncourt. Obviously, we cannot go, neither Karim, my brother, myself, or Stéphane to Syria, to Bargilus. So what we're doing is trying to adapt to manage the vineyard. Before the harvest time, and as you probably know, uh, the most important uh, uh, thing is to taste the grapes. Uh, that this is something we do usually by walking into the vineyard and spending hours and hours just picking the, the grapes and tasting them to see if they, they're ripe enough for, for harvest. So what we're doing now is putting an alternative system and adapting to this by shipping, by bringing by taxi these grapes from many different parcels on packs of ice every two, three days. And this is how we're determining first for the whites, then for the reds, the right exact time of harvest. So these are the small examples of how we're trying how we're trying to adapt to the problems that we encounter today on the logistics transport visit etc he's also having to work from photographs as well exactly so we have a, a bunch of photographs being sent by email every two three days on the grapes on the on the vines uh, to see the healthiness of the the, the vines etc Obviously. Um, anything about the future or the, what, how we see uh, the future of Bargelous in the next years? Yes. Do you think, I mean, do you think, first of all, where do you see the future of wine in the region, both in Lebanon and Syria? And then specifically, what do you see in f as far as Syria is concerned specifically? So let's go from the general to the specific. Lebanon and Syria, the region, the wine industry, development of wine, and then the future for winemaking in Syria. You mean the industry in five years, ten years? Yes, let's say, for example. And Objective? Bargelous's role as a pioneer. Okay, so objectively or my, my personal opinion? Your opinion, personal. My personal opinion is that hopefully will be more than a vineyard in Syria. So I hope Bargelius will not be the only wine produced in Syria. That we will be much, uh, uh, there will be many more uh, uh, vineyards producing wine in Syria. Uh, why am I saying this? Because I think we have to build an, uh, a real industry and, uh, and the equality industry. And to do that, we need legislation and legislation is usually uh, triggered or pressured uh, by the private sector. And uh, this is extremely important. It's the same thing I'm saying for Lebanon. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, there were probably maybe 15 or 20 uh, 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 producers or even less. Uh, now there are 40 producers. Uh, I hope that we will reach 100 producers in the next 10 or 15 years, and I don't think this is impossible. I think this is possible. Obviously, this has to be accompanied by legislation on 
certific uh, geographic certification. Uh, why? Because to 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 uh, uh, make sure there is quality producers, there are quality producers. We need to make sure that the grapes origin is mentioned on the bottles. So. At the same time, I wish that in the next 10 years we are 100 in Lebanon. At the same time, I wish that the legislation will go accompanying uh, 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 next to, the, to, to this development. And, and do you think, <coughs> as I do, that the region will always make wine and the very character of the region will not allow itself to be maybe overtaken by religious fundamental um, is that a fear for you, or do you, do you think that the very nature of who we are will not allow this to, to happen? This is a question I don't think I can answer you, because this is something that you cannot control. It's something that you have to, uh, to live. Uh, all the hopes are that we will continue to be living in a country that is completely free for any kind of choice, whether religious or anything else. So um, I hope we'll be living in, a, in countries that allow for private initiatives, whatever they are, and more specifically, wine development, obviously. And you're prepared to accept that that private initiative might have to face the challenges, but it has done for centuries, so you'll carry on doing it. I think uh, the commitment to land is, uh, is, uh, means everything. I think all these fears are being taken into account when you invest in land in, in Lebanon or the region, whether it is land for agriculture, land for building, land for vineyards, the investment in land is a statement. Of staying. Of staying. Great. That was fantastic. Yes.